It's now my pleasure to introduce to you our final speaker of the evening, a person who has practiced every principle to which you've been exposed multiple times over the course of an amazing career. Working backwards, he is the founder of Inspire Kindness. Before that, the founder of Simple Truths, and in that role, wrote more than 20 books that sold more than 3 million copies. Before that, the founder and CEO of Successories, which revolutionized what motivation in the workplace and for individuals was all about. Before that, the founder of McCord Travel, which became the largest travel group in the Midwest. Before that, the vice president of Orville Kemp Food Company. And before that, his first successful business. Hi there. Are you the mom here? Because he is, in fact, a Southwestern bookman. One of the great privileges of my life was getting to meet him 35 years ago, to be able to be influenced by him, to learn from him, and now to have a chance to bring him to the stage where all of you can meet him. A true Southwestern bookman, an amazing human being, and somebody that we are delighted to have here with you. Please join with me in welcoming Mr. Mac Anderson. Thank you for those kind words, Dan. Uh, I've got to apologize before I start. Uh, in the last couple of days, I've had a mild case of vertigo. That's that inner ear thing which affects your equilibrium. So I usually walk around quite a bit when I speak, but today, stay a little closer to the podium just, uh, just in case. I don't want this gentleman to have to catch me on, on the, uh, <clears throat> and probably nothing will happen, but I feel a little safer that way. But uh, I want to thank Dan. And let's be truthful. I mean, the real reason I'm here tonight is that I'm the only speaker that could find that would agree to this time slot. <laughs> <clears throat> and I know it's late, but hang on, and for the next 25 minutes, hopefully, we'll, we'll have some fun. And you know what? I'm truly, truly honored to be here tonight. Uh, uh, looking out at this uh, audience and, and these smiling faces, uh, it brings back so many memories of the four summers that I sold for Southwestern. And I can say without a doubt, not one ounce of doubt, that my decision to sell books for Southwestern was one of the most important decisions that I ever made in my life. Because what I learned about discipline, what I learned about leadership, and, and what I learned about myself was truly the foundation for any success that I enjoyed as, as an entrepreneur. And I will be forever grateful for that opportunity. And I want to say that uh, I've known Dustin for about five years. I, I've known Dan for 35. I've known Henry, known Henry Bedford for 25, and I have to say I have the greatest respect for these individuals, not only as a leader, but as human beings. And I am truly honored to call them my friend. You know, my 40 years as an entrepreneur have been interesting. Uh, uh, they've been a lot of fun. Uh, I think I learned a lot. I learned a, a few lessons along the way. And, and hopefully tonight, uh, in the next 25 minutes, I'll share a, a few things with you, a few lessons learned, and, and you can take a few nuggets uh, home with you. And one of the things I learned was the power of what I'll call a 212 mindset. There's that law of science that states at 211, water is hot, I mean, very hot. But at 212, it boils and turns to steam, and steam can power a locomotive. It's that one extra degree, I mean, just one, that makes all the difference. And so many times in business and in life, there's that one extra degree of effort that will separate the good from the great. I mean, think about it. How many great leaders, great ones, have you known that didn't do their jobs and then some? 
How many great salespeople have you known that didn't do their job and, and, and then some? I mean, let's take it one step further. How many great teachers, great coaches, even great parents have you known that didn't embrace the 212 philosophy? They may not have known it, but they did. And once you hear this simple, uncomplicated analogy for excellence, I have to warn you, it'll be hard to forget. Barbara Glanz is a speaker and an author, and years ago, a few years ago, she addressed a large audience, over 3,000 people, it was a grocery store chain. And at the end of her speech, she put up her contact information and said, you know, if you have any great service stories to share with me, I would love to hear about it. And about a month later, she gets a call. And the young man on the other end said, Barbara, said, my name is Johnny. I, I, I'm a bagger at the grocery store, and, and I have Down syndrome. But I heard what you had to say about service, and, and, and I liked it. But I thought, and thought, I mean, what, what can I do? I'm just a bagger. And then I had an idea. You know, I love sayings, he said. I love quotes, and I thought each day I'd pick out one of my favorite sayings. And at night, my dad and I would type it out on the computer, and we'd cut out the strips, and I'd sign the back of each strip. And the next day, I'd just drop it right in the bag and then say, I hope you enjoy my quote of the day. I mean, what do you think, Barbara? Barbara said, Johnny, I mean, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. And about a month later, she gets another call. This time it's from the store manager. And she said, Barbara, I, I got to share with you what, what's happened at her store. Came out the other day, and one line was three times longer than the other. She said, I went to, he, he went out to encourage him to move over to the other checkouts, and they wouldn't budge. I mean, they all wanted to see Johnny's quote of the day. In fact, one lady said, you know, I used to come here once a week. Now I come two and three times just to see the smile on his face when he drops in his favorite quote. So the store manager said, you know, the next day I rounded up my team and I shared with him what Johnny was doing to create memories for the customer. And a few weeks later, I noticed the lady in the flower department, she had a broken flower. She'd clip it off and go out and find a an elderly lady and pin on a corsage, and the guy in the meat department loves Snoopy, and he brings some of his favorite Snoopy stickers and put them on the meat package. And the manager said, Barbara, you know, everybody in the store has found a way to put their mark on service. He said, we're having the time of our life. Everybody in this small town is talking about us. And it happened for one reason. Johnny decided to do something. In other words, one extra degree made all the difference. I also learned the importance, the power of clearly defined and realistic goals. You know, experts on motivation, uh, they, differ, they differ and disagree on a lot of things, but one thing they all agree on is that your level of motivation is directly tied to your expected probability of success. In other words, if you think you can do something, you're likely to be highly motivated, but if for whatever reason you think you can't, your levels of motivation will diminish greatly. And I learned a very important lesson about that when I was a freshman in college. Uh, I was sitting there feeling sorry for myself, had a lot to do, very little time to do it. And my sweet mate comes over and said, you know, Mac, let me just share something my grandmother told me a few years ago. I said, what's that? She told me, inch by inch, life's a cinch. And yard by yard, life is hard. I says, Bob, uh, here I am drowning in work and your lifeline's a quote from your grandmother? I said, come on. <laughs> but when he left, those 12 little words kept dancing in my head. I took out a sheet of paper and wrote all the things I had to do in the next three days. <clears throat> and that night, stayed up late and started knocking them off one by one. And three days later, I took it out and marked through the last thing on the list. And, and you know what? It felt great. And then I took out another sheet and I tore off the corner and I wrote the words, inch by inch, life's a cinch. Yard by yard, life is hard. I 
fold it up and put it in my wallet. A lot of you know, I've been collecting quotations uh, ever since. You know, success doesn't come cascading like Niagara Falls. It usually comes one drop at a time through clearly defined and realistic goals. You know, a lot of people, when I speak, uh, they ask me, how did you start Successories? I mean, that, that's such a simple idea. I mean, what'd you do, just wake up one day and say, you know, I think I'll start a company selling motivational posters? Didn't quite work that way. <clears throat> when I sold McCord Travel, I kept a small recognition award business, and my, uh, one of my clients was uh, Ford Motor Company, and we were supplying the, the awards for a banquet, 2,000 dealers, and they, their theme was motivation. They said, Mac, you know, what we, our theme's motivation. Well, what could we leave at each plate? And I said, well, I've collected what I think are motivational quotes over the years. Maybe you could put them in a little book, put your name on it, and, and hopefully they'd like it. He said, let's do it. Well, the next day, the phone was ringing off the wall. Dealers were calling, asking for more copies of this little book, 80 pages with a single quote on, on each page. <clears throat> so I said, wow. People like quotes, uh, just, just like I do. And then I thought, you know, I wonder if I could actually sell this little book. So to find out, I took a dozen books out to three different hotel gift shops and said, look, I'm going to give you these 12 books if you'll sell them on this little plastic easel, easel one at a time right next to the register. <clears throat> so I came back a week later, and they were all gone. They said most of them sold the first couple of days. I said, wow, people really do like quotes. So I, one hotel after the other picked up the book, started selling it. The airport shop started selling it next to the register. And, and over the next two years, we sold 800,000 copies of that little book. So then I had another idea. Halfway through, I said, I wonder if people would want to put quotes on the wall. So to find out, I put a picture of a brass plaque in the back of the book and an order form next to it said, look, if you, if you like <coughs> quotes, you can pick any one of these 80 quotes in the book and we'll put it on a brass plaque for, for $19.95. And the phone continued to ring. And they didn't buy just one. They bought 10, 15, 50 to reinforce what they believed. So successories evolved from the little quote book to the brass plaque to what was our breakthrough idea of combining beautiful photographs with words to reinforce corporate values and personal goals. So never forget, success doesn't come cascading like Niagara Falls. It usually comes one drop at a time, or in your case, one door at a time. I learned also that to succeed at anything you need to get off the path of least resistance because procrastination is a success killer. Recently I heard a story about a lady who was going through her, her desk drawer and she looks down, she sees an old yellowed receipt and she smiles because 20 years ago she'd taken a pair of shoes into the shoe shop and, and forgotten to pick them up. And she thinks, well, well maybe, just maybe they're still there. So the next day, she gets into her car, she drives down to the shoe shop, and she's very embarrassed. She asks for the manager. He comes out, and she said, could you check to see if by chance they're still here? He said, okay. He comes back in about three minutes, and she said, well, are, are, are they here? He said, yep, they'll be ready on Friday. <laughs> you know, according to William James, one of the founders of modern psychology, he said that procrastination can be attitude's natural assassin. There is nothing so fatiguing as an uncompleted task. Now, let me say that again. Procrastination can be attitude's natural assassin. There's nothing so fatiguing as an uncompleted task. Now, here's a tip that uh, can help you, I think, with your procrastination issues. I know it sure helped me when I heard it a few years ago. There's an old saying that says, if the first thing you do when you get up in the morning is eat a live frog, then nothing worse can happen for the rest of the day. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty safe assumption. <laughs> and Brian Tracy, in his book, Eat the Frog, said, your frog should be the most difficult thing on your things to do list, because if you eat that first, it'll give you energy and momentum for the rest of the day. But if you don't, if you let him sit there on the plate and stare at you, while you do a hundred unimportant things, it can drain your energy and you won't even know it. So here's your assignment for the next 30 days. Take a look at your list. Circle the frog. Eat that first. And you know what? You'll thank me for it. In fact, you may even send me a Christmas card. <clears throat> Last on my list, but certainly not least, I learned to understand the power of kindness. Because you know what? Companies don't succeed. People do. Mary Kay Ash was loved by her people. She's the founder of Mary Kay Cosmetics. And about 30 years ago, I got to hear her speak. And she talked about her first sales job. She was in her early 20s, and she was so excited she was going to get to go to the convention and meet the number one guy in the company. So she went the night before the reception. She sees him across the room. She makes her way through the crowd, extends her hand. She said, could you share with me some of your secrets to success? And, and you know what he said? Nothing. He turned and walked away. And Mary Kay promised herself at that moment that if she ever enjoyed any success in her life, she would share it with others. And when she became successful and walked into a room filled with people, she pretended that everyone in the room had a sign around their neck that said, make me feel important. Because you know what? We all want to feel important. And one of the simplest acts of kindness one of the simplest ways to make anyone feel important is to sincerely listen to what they have to say. Jim Cathcart had a great definition for listening. He said, listening is wanting to hear. It's an emotional process. He said, most of us all hear while waiting to talk. He said, there's a simple two-step model that'll help you perfect the art of listening. It's listen, ask a question. Listen, ask. Listen, ask. But he said, most people use the other two-step model, and that one is hear, talk. Hear, talk. Remember Cathcart's definition. Listening is wanting to hear, and the key word in that definition is the word wanting. When I was a senior in college, I got to hear Charlie Cullen speak. And I was so excited because the year before, Charlie's peers in the speaking industry had, had ranked him the number one speaker in, in the country. But that day, as a favor to his nephew, he was speaking to 20 college students at, at the Holiday Inn. And he talked about the keys to success, talked about perseverance, believing in yourself, humility. But he told a story at the end that I'll never forget. He said he was at the Oklahoma City Airport, and he looks up, and he sees two little girls, and they're skipping. He said their eyes were lit up like diamonds, and they were singing, Daddy's coming home on a big jet. Daddy's coming home on a big jet. He said their mom was so proud of them, she kind of corralled them against the gate where their father was coming out. And as the father came toward them, he walked right past his wife and the girls, and he yelled at his wife, why in the heck? Didn't you bring my top coat? And Charlie said, you know, here's a guy who had the opportunity to be great. And he didn't even recognize it. I mean, how many times a, a day, a week, a month, a year, do we have the opportunity to be great, to be kind, and not even know it? On... Uh, March the 5th, 2003, I was listening to Good Morning America while I was eating breakfast, and, and Charlie Gibson was interviewing General Earl Hailston, the general for the U.S. Marines. And the general was stationed three miles off the border of Iraq, uh, waiting 
to go to war. And Charlie said, toward the end of the interview, he said, General, uh, uh, do you have any hobbies other than your profession? He said, yeah, yeah, I do. He said, I love taking photographs, he said, especially of my men. He said, during the day, I've been here three days, I go out and I take the photographs of my men at night, I go back to my tent, and I, I email the photo with a short note back to their moms in the state. Charlie said, what do you say? The general pulled up his last note on the computer and here's what it said. It said, Dear Mrs. Johnson, thought you might enjoy seeing this picture of your son. He's doing great. I also wanted you to know you did a wonderful job of raising him. You must be very proud. I can certainly tell you that I'm honored to serve with him in the U.S. Marines, General Earl Haleson. I got to tell you, uh, I had goosebumps uh, as I watched. And then I watched Charlie go out in the field and talk to some of his men at random, and you could feel the love and respect that they had for their leader. You may have heard the quote, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And here's a man who understood what caring, kindness, and 212 leadership was all about. I'm gonna close my presentation tonight by sharing something that has nothing to do with business, nothing to do with selling, but everything to do with life. I read of a man who stood to speak at the funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on a tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that first came her date of birth, and he spoke the following date with tears, but he said what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time she'd spent alive on earth, and everyone who loved her know what that little line was worth. For it matters not how much we own, the house, the cars, the cash, what matters most is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. So think about this long and hard. Are there things you'd like to change? Because you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. If we could just slow down enough to consider what's true and real and, and always try to understand the way that other people feel. And be less quick to anger, show appreciation more, and, and love the people in our lives like we never loved before. We treat each other with respect, and more often wear a smile, remembering this, that this special dash will only last a little while. So when your eulogy's being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they said about how you lived your dash? Thank you very much. You were terrific for staying up this late. <laughs> And I really appreciate it. Yeah, hi. We have a gift for you, Matt. Oh, wow. Officially, your book and yeah. shirt. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, let me, thank let me you. give you a hug. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, where'd you get that outfit? I like that. Yeah, it's pretty cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.